You're listening to We're Talking Sports with Ben Burns and Richie Donnell. Remember to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Now, without further ado, Ben Burns and Richie Donnell. All right, people, first show of the week. Uh, sorry we couldn't do it uh, on Monday. Yesterday we had a lot of stuff going on, but uh, a little bit of a Tuesday special. Yeah, I nothing nothing say. wrong with the Tuesday no, special. No, so uh, what, what, are we, what are we talking about today? Um, it looks like almost an entire uh, full show of, of the NFL today. Oof. I can't complain with that, though. No, I mean... Do love some NFL football. As, as, a, as a full... Full bred American. I, I don't think that I can complain about strictly no, NFL. No, and it's the real football. Right. Real, right. not soccer. Yeah, absolutely. I. You'll never find us talking about soccer. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> unless, unless somehow we. Unless Aaron Rodgers switches sports. Yeah. We're not talking about soccer. Yeah. Or or Cristiano Ronaldo calls me personally and says, oh, Yeah. I love the podcast." Can I hey, get on? Hey, let's do an interview with him. Let's yeah, do it. I mean, I would be down for that. Let's but that's probably it. the only way soccer is ever. Yep. Ever getting that. Yep. All right. So, um, you ready to do this? Let's do it. Okay. I'm Ben Burns. Richie Dunnell. We're talking sports. So, uh, what do you want to talk about first? Uh, first things first, we uh, want to send our thoughts and prayers. James Conner, uh, running back for the University of Pittsburgh, was diagnosed with cancer. Mm. Uh, he was the ACC Player of the Year last year. Um, had a bright future. Was probably going to be an NFL running back at some point. Um, but similar to the situation that we saw with Mark Herzlick, who played for Boston College, yep. uh, obviously that comes first. Yeah. Um, but wanted to get the the sad news you know out of the way uh, yeah. but anybody out there you know send your thoughts and prayers with him and his family and now let's get into the good stuff uh sunday obviously last week thursday we covered on last mm-hmm. week's episode um so let's talk about let's talk about sunday yes. um big games um we we mentioned seattle minnesota was a huge game definitely that that kind of went in a way that i was not i not expecting yeah seattle looked like the uh, the old Seattle Seahawks of the last couple of years, right, right, um, which is good offense and definitely good defense. They shut Adrian Peterson down. Yeah. Um. So and and another big game. Uh. Even though not necessarily teams fighting per, for position, but that uh, Carolina New Orleans Saints game. I mean, watching that game, that was one of the best games that I've seen in a long time. For sure. Um. But <laughs> Ted Ginn. I mean, how many times is he gonna drop? Drop a ball. I mean, I could have caught those balls. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah. I mean, and I may not have burned the uh, the corner, much mm-hmm. like Ted Ginn did, but mm-hmm. I could have caught that. So, looking at the playoff picture, uh, Green Bay has now moved up. Um, yep, they are now, now on top of the north. Right. Uh, now, as a Packer fan, what would be, I guess, your favorite scenario? I mean, what, what are you – do you want them to win the division and then end up having to face Seattle – or would you rather them fall back to the six seed or the five seed and face the winner of the NFC? Oh, I think any time you can play at Lambeau, I would go with that. Okay. Um, you know, obviously playing Seattle again and beating them again is going to be tough, but I would rather have that situation than um, playing uh, the Giants or the Redskins, whoever comes out on top of the East. Okay. Um, so, but also in the AFC with almost everybody winning yesterday both the Jets the uh, the Chiefs, Chiefs and the Pittsburgh Steelers yeah um, Houston I believe they they lost to the bills um, so they now fall yeah. five to six and six I mean who, who do you see coming out of the AFC who's gonna who do you think is gonna get that final spot um, I think if Ben Roethlisberger stays healthy I think Pittsburgh is almost guaranteed um, a wild card spot they all look good on offense like I said D'Angelo Williams was gonna have a big game he showed up um, and then uh, Pittsburgh's uh, two receivers Antonio Brown 
and Martavis Bryant both had very good games. I think they're going to hang on for the rest of the regular season, and they'll grab um, a spot. And as for the other spot, I think Kansas City's looking really good. I picked Oakland to win that game, but uh, Kansas City really showed their dominance. And, um, I mean, they've been staying really tough uh, after having a pretty poor start. Yeah, and, and despite, uh, you know, even the fact that they're on this winning streak, it, this is arguably... Uh, despite their best player or franchise player in Jamal Charles. So, I mean, can we, is it fair to say Andy Reid is now back in the coach of the year candidacy uh, conversation? Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, based on, like you said, their trials and tribulations of losing their best player, um, absolutely. All right. So, this weekend, um, I watched the whole Bears game um, and then I watched the Carolina game. Mm -hmm. So, I didn't get to see a whole. Uh, Broad of games, but from from this weekend, I took away my MVP, Mariota. I think if he stays healthy, Tennessee got it right. I mean, there was yeah. a lot of talk about how bad he could be, how he can't read defenses, can't make NFL throws. But so far, Mariota has has been a, a bright spot for that organization. Twenty for twenty nine, two hundred sixty eight yards, three touchdowns, and he had an eighty seven yard touchdown run. Wow. I mean, that's kind of the that's the impressive. dynamic ability that that you're looking at with Mariota, Brandon Marshall. Um, Having watched him play uh, when he was with the Bears, I mean, he's dynamic, but what he's doing with the Jets just, to me, is even more unreal because it's not like, I mean, we all know the potential of Elshon Jeffrey. Um, I don't think, even though he's paid like it, I think Elshon Jeffrey is more dynamic than Eric Decker. So Brandon Marshall being able to, to do what he's doing this year is huge. And Russell Wilson at it again. I mean... There's nothing stopping this guy. I mean, coming out of Wisconsin, they said, ah, you're too short. Beats that. Then they're struggling, and now he's just lighting the world on fire. For sure. I mean, um, Tony, I think... Tony Dungy made a comment that Seattle has gone from two years ago being a defensive team when they destroyed Denver to now uh, the focal point of that team is, a, is as an offensive team. That's debatable, but, uh, I mean, for sure, Russell Wilson has – this might be his best season – Right, I, I completely agree. So yesterday, like we were talking about the Carolina game. Yeah. Cam Newton goes down the field on that game-winning drive. With the Patriots losing in surprising fashion, did Cam Newton with the, with that drive solidify himself the MVP for this season? He's mean? he's number one right now as MVP. I don't think it solidified him in any way. Um, Right now, I would say the, the three candidates right now, I think I said this before, was Cam, Tom Brady, and Andy Dalton. Okay. Um, I think Dalton still has a shot at MVP. Um, I mean, and depending on how Carolina does, Carson Palmer right. still. That, that's what I was going to say. Instead of Andy Dalton, I would go with Carson Palmer. But both those guys obviously on winning teams. And Cincinnati now being the one seed. I mean, the Patriots have fallen from one to three with this one loss, despite the fact that they're ten and two because of the tiebreaker with Denver, yeah. um, what what is your outlook on that? If if the Patriots have to play that first weekend, um, the last couple of years we've kind of seen the hot team make it to the Super Bowl with a team that plays that first weekend in a in a wild card game, so to speak. Uh, how does that look for the Patriots? Does that help them? Um, does it not help them? And then the possibility of Gronkowski. I think they would prefer, obviously, to um, take a bye. First of all, it just because they've kind of been banged up. Yeah. And I think if they can take a week off, maybe, you know, maybe Edelman. That depends on whether or not Edelman plays or right. not. So um, I think with this Patriots team currently, um, and you even have to consider Tom Brady's age because he is getting up there, mm -hmm. even though he hasn't shown it too much. I think in the next couple of weeks, including uh, this past game, we saw it a little bit. Right. Because he is aging, yep. and I think if he can get a week off, that would help them. Yeah, and I mean, going forward, uh, depending upon, I, I don't know what their schedule looks like, but obviously as they, if they start to blow teams out, we'll probably see a little bit more of uh, Jimmy Garoppolo to get Tom Brady that, that for extra sure. rest. For sure, for um, sure. As I mentioned uh, a little bit ago, Ted Ginn. I mean, this is a guy who was a first-round pick. He was a high pick by the Miami Dolphins. He was kind of a, a spark plug at Ohio State. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, for whatever reason, this year, he dropped a game winner earlier this season. He dropped two touchdowns yesterday. I mean, if, if you're a coach, when do you finally say, okay, enough's enough. We're going to sit this guy down and get somebody else in there. 
Oh, I think it should be sooner rather than later. Ted Ginn's career, he's mostly just been known as a kick returner. Right. That kind of started when he was in San Francisco. Uh, was probably, for a while, he was the dan most dangerous kick returner. That was kind of after Devin Hester and Josh Cribbs kind of, uh, did you know, right, were off right. the picture. Yep. Um, and then... He did it again with Arizona and now with Carolina. Now he's just playing receiver really because, uh, I mean, with Kelvin Benjamin right. not, hurt. not yep. playing, um, they need a couple extra guys, and that might just be their downfall for the season is lack of receivers. Yeah, and I, I noticed the one thing that, that I picked up on was after one of the drop balls, they, they put Philly Brown in, mm -hmm. and he immediately got a penalty, which, which hurts because you're essentially, like you said, with the injury to Benjamin, um, when you pull out Ted Ginn, essentially you're putting a young guy in there, and you have to have faith in that young player, especially yeah. at, that, at that Philly Brown's level. also uh, not accustomed to being too much on offense. Remember, last year his rookie year was really just a special team or right. so, um, and he's been starting a couple games too. Yep. So uh, that's a lot of responsibility for guys who don't have much experience on the offense. Okay, so this weekend, one of the the biggest conversations in my household, um, Do Tom Brady passed Dan Marino on the all-time touchdowns list. Uh, he's at I believe 422, um, or I don't know if he threw more, but when I yeah. had saw it, it was at he was at 422. Um, so congratulations to Tom Brady for that. Um, just continues to add accolades to, to the resume um, as he continues to fight for the greatest quarterback of all time. Drew Brees is next. Uh, Drew Brees is within four touchdowns of Dan Marino. He'll break. He'll probably pass him this year. Um, and then obviously whenever Tom Brady retires, Drew Brees is two years younger. So as long as he continues to play, he will probably pass Tom Brady. So let me ask you this. In terms of yards and touchdowns, um, obviously there's a huge discrepancy in both. Will anybody ever catch Peyton Manning? Um, I mean, ever? Probably eventually. Eventually. I okay. just think is, with... Is there any active player? I'm sorry. Let me rephrase um, that. I mean, I would say right now the person that has the best shot is Andrew Luck. Okay. Um, I mean, maybe even Andy Dalton. Yeah. You saw... Um, he was the second quarterback all time to have 3,000 passing yards in each of his five seasons. First person to do that was Peyton Manning. Okay. Um, and just the way the game has been changing has been more pass first, and you're seeing people throw 300 yards like it's no problem. I mean, before then it was, it, I mean, it was 200 yards was incredible. Now 300 yards seems like it's completely normal. Um, so with the passing game. The way it is right now, I think Andy Dalton can get up there as long as he keeps that starting spot, and I think um, I think Andrew Luck will get there too. Yeah, I we um, it, at Miles we talked about how the yards is a little bit easier compared to the touchdowns. Obviously, for what you sure, mentioned sure. Um, of now that offenses throw a lot more and kind of air it out a little bit. Um, the one name that that constantly came up was Matthew Stafford. Um, Despite wherever he plays, I, we, he's got two 5,000-yard seasons under his belt. Um, and obviously the first two years of injuries hurts him. But, you know, no matter where he plays, the way that, that he's able to air it out and just throw the ball around, um, to me, I think, he, you know, in that group with Locke and, and Andy Dalton could get there for yards. But touchdowns, I mean, to average thirty between 30 and 40 touchdowns a season over – you know, you're talking almost 20 years. That That's incredible. I mean, and both Brady and Manning had seasons over 50. Right. Yeah, and Manning Manning had two. Um, so, to me, the only person that I thought of that, that is active that may have a chance would be Derek Carr, um, being probably the, the second youngest starter I, I agree with right that. now. I agree. Um, it, but that that's just incredible, and that just speaks to the ability of Peyton Manning um, at 535 career touchdowns, that's just that is unbelievable. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins this weekend scored his tenth receiving touchdown, breaking Andre Johnson's single season record. Now, as great as Andre Johnson is, he never scored double that's digit true. touchdowns. Yep, that is absolutely that, true. That's incredible. I mean, does that speak to? Let's put it this way: Does that speak to how good Andre Johnson is, or DeAndre Adams could be, or just how bad the quarterbacks? <laughs> Andre Johnson had over his career. Yeah, think about it this way. The best quarterback of Texans history is Matt Schaub. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, Matt Schaub had had a Pro Bowl season, yeah, granted, but yeah, that's that's it, no knock on, on Matt Schaub, right? But no, I mean, just, yeah. So, and I mean, DeAndre Hopkins has already proven that uh, he is a number one receiver, a Pro Bowl receiver too. Right. Um, so uh, he's doing great, and I think he will have an Andre Johnson like career. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, obviously, it'll be hard to pass any any records in terms of uh, career numbers for Andre Johnson as he's probably a first ballot Hall of Fame wide receiver and to do it with you know the quarterbacks that he had mainly you know David Carr um, he had mm-hmm. Brian Hoyer like you said Matt Shaw for for a bit and, and Case Keenum and TJ Yates and just a whole bunch of guys that are yeah. not, are not starters in the NFL. <clears throat> just speaks to how good good Andre Johnson is. Uh, so let's talk about what you mentioned before. Seattle is back. Are they probably the most dangerous team right now in terms of teams that are, you know, they're not with the upper echelon right now? Um, I would say, I would say, yeah. I mean, they're, I think, the the most up-and-coming team. Yep. I mean, I think we kind of know what, what Carolina brings now. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been talking about them forever. Um you know, Green Bay has been on the spotlight um, for a while now. Uh, I mean, they've lost four of the last six, so there's a, still a big question mark there. So, yeah, I would say Seattle, just knowing that they can get hot right. a lot, and, and once their defense is on point, they're they're impossible to stop. And now that Russell Wilson is playing the best he's ever played, um, yeah, I mean, nobody's going to want to play them in the playoffs. Right, I agree. And and the biggest thing is, especially, like, let's just say Seattle were to come to Green Bay, you talk about the home field advantage of <clears throat> of just being in Lambeau <clears throat> and the things that Lambeau offers to yep. the Packers. It's just a special place to be. Sure. But for Seattle, the, the thing that, that scares me if I'm any team in the playoff is – to know how well Thomas Rawls is doing, and they're still going to get Marshawn Lynch back at some point. That that those two guys complementing each other mm-hmm. terrifies me because we've seen what Marshawn Lynch can do with the ball in his hands, and some of the playoff runs that he had, you know, like the one against New Orleans, just he he terrifies me as a as a backfield threat. Definitely. Um, let's talk about a guy that that you, you I think we're we're both sold on him. But at, at the point, you, you don't want to fall in love because no. you, you never know. Odell Beckham Jr. Again, this, this past weekend, I believe it was a 72-yard touchdown reception. Yeah. He just he finds ways to score. And he just seems to be kind of the new face of what wide receivers are going to be um, in terms of the athletic ability and the insane catches, mm-hmm. so to speak. Um, what I mean... As a future and and potential for his career, where where do you see Odell Beckham going? Because um, Eli's going to be done soon. I yeah. Mean, where, where do you see Odell Beckham's career kind of headed? Well, it seems like he can catch anything, no matter where the quarterback throws it. I I don't know, <laughs> but I mean he's a he's a good player. I and I think you know we were kind of talking about DeAndre Hopkins, Andre Johnson. Those guys played with bad quarterbacks, yeah. and no matter who's after Eli. Um, I think he'll be able to, you know, continue to have 1,200-yard, 10-touchdown seasons. Yeah. Um, I'm not too worried that he's going to decline. Is there any way that Odell Beckham can find a way to catch the ball better than that Dallas game? Where where he was completely – he got penalized uh, <laughs> with the pass interference, hand over his head, Three fingers falling into the end zone. Is, is there any way that he can make a better catch than that? I mean, uh, unless, like, the ball sticks to his pinky finger, <laughs> I don't see a better catch than that. Yeah. Um, but I don't want to say no just because, I mean, he's had about five catches already in his two-year career where, where it's just amazing. Yeah, yeah. he had one, what, two weeks ago Yeah, uh, where he was falling into the end zone. And a just, one-handed dive, yeah, basically. It, th- this guy is, is unreal. So is it fair to say the Madden curse is officially over? It's done. You know, there was always that, that worry about being the cover boy, you know, people getting hurt oh, or not. Oh, yeah, no, it's over. Yeah, I mean, okay. Richard Sherman didn't have anything happen to him last year. Okay. Uh, but nobody cares about Madden anymore, so no, that's, yeah. it's irrelevant. <laughs> how do you feel about Monty Ball working out for the Packers? I, how can you, how can I not be excited? He's a Wisconsin Badger coming back to Wisconsin. Anytime a Wisconsin Badger seems like 
uh, has anything related to the Packers, it's an exciting time, and that speaks for Wisconsin sports. But um, it makes sense to me, uh, just because you know when he came out of Wisconsin. Um, I mean, if you didn't know it already, the Packers were interested in Monte Ball. Um, if he was available uh, at the same time they picked Lacey, they probably would have picked Monte Ball over Eddie. Um, so, I mean, I think I don't see this as a problem, um, but it worries me for Lacey. Just because, yeah. um, you know, he was on a roll, then only played, what, 10 snaps? Uh, yep. Because there was a little bit more of off-field issues. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe hanging out with Alonzo Harris a little bit. Uh, too much. Who ended up getting cut? Right, for the same reason. Yeah. What Lacey's uh, playing time was docked. Yes. So, I don't know. I think this is going to be interesting. I hope they sign him. Uh, but that also means uh, John Crockett will probably go back to the practice squad, who had a good game on yeah. Thursday. Now, um, like you mentioned, with John Crockett. Now, for him to go back to the practice squad, Green Bay, I believe, would have to cut him. Yes, and, and, and then he'll go on waivers. Yeah. Now, is is there fear? Uh, we've seen kind of Monte Ball's been around or been in Denver for for a number of years, and we kind of saw mm -hmm. what what he can do as a, as an NFL running back. Yeah. Um, to you, uh, would there be fear that you're going to sign Monte Ball? Maybe as that number three back, cut Crockett, and somebody grabs him. Yeah. And he turns into a stud, and it's like, you yeah, know what? we had him. But we let him. Yeah, go that's because... tough. Um, I'm glad I'm not making that decision, though. Um, I mean, if I'm if I'm playing the GM right now, um, I would keep Crockett. Okay. So I, keep Crockett instead of signing Monte Ball. You know, if I'm if I'm looking at this unbiased with all the carries Monte Ball received in Wisconsin, um, I mean, is, is he a dead horse essentially? Te yeah, technically, he's about 30 years old and running back age. Yeah. So that's I mean, that's tough. Unfortunately, I yeah. mean, he had a great yeah, career at right. Wisconsin, um, mm -hmm. but a lot of that was because he received, you know, 30, 35 carries a game. Right, right. And this, and that's despite the fact that he had he had two other good running backs on the team, uh, James White and Melvin Gordon, they still, for whatever reason, just kept feeding him the ball, which ultimately yeah. led to uh, a Big Ten, you know, record-breaking mm -hmm. year, um, you know, which is great for Wisconsin, but obviously, as we're seeing, ball. yeah, Monty Ball uh, kind of... Kind of fell off there a little yeah. bit with all the cares. So I was scrolling through through ESPN, and Mel Kiper, one of our all time favorites, who just I I don't know what to think of Kiper. Just some of the things <laughs> that he says are so off the wall. But he he released a his top ten rookies for the season, um, and I'm gonna give you the list, and then I'm gonna give you some guys that that he left off that that I thought should have been on there. And I just kind of want to get your opinion on this. So he had Ronald Darby right now as the number one rookie for the Bills, okay. um, who's been been playing well. Yes. Amari Cooper, I think we both can agree, is having a fantastic, will probably win Offensive Rookie of the Year. Um, Possibly. Is, is having a great year. Leonard Williams for the Jets. Uh, now, obviously, quarterback hits and hurries aren't a registered sack, but he's, he's having a huge impact there for the Jets. Uh, Quan Alexander from the Buccaneers, who just recently got suspended, but he... He uh, had some, some great games, and then the game with Atlanta was it right after his brother got murdered, I believe, mm -hmm. where he, he just played lights out. Stephon Diggs, who we've seen, who plays from Minnesota. Yeah. Uh, Jameis Winston, Mariota, uh, Henry Anderson, who I believe is out with a torn ACL for the Colts but was having a very good year. Demarius Randall. Who is friends with me on PlayStation. Really? Yeah. Oh, how did you pull that one off? <laughs> Long story. All right. And then Jordan Hicks, who is also out with a torn ACL. Are the guys that Mel Kuyper has in his top ten? For me, the first thing I said is, how do you leave Todd Gurley? Yeah. I mean, I mean Todd Gurley, uh, you, as you mentioned, is probably – he's probably – if he stays healthy, he's a Hall of Famer. To me, back. he's number one on my list. Yeah, I mean, how do you – And, you know, I mean, you just, you know, looking at all those guys' stats. Yeah, Darby has played great. Amari Cooper, um, both incredible, you know – even if you don't look at the stats. But I think Todd Gurley, just watching him play. I was at the Green Bay-St. Louis game. That's kind of the game where he blew up. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, he looked like a vet. It looked like, I mean, I've, I've gone to games. I went to the, the Dallas game with DeMarco Murray, where he was probably the top running back in the league last right. year. Uh, I mean, he played better, or he played just as well, if not better, than DeMarco Murray did. Okay. Um, I also and have look better. Marcus Peters yes. from from the Chiefs. To me, that was a great great pickup. 
I mean, he he got in trouble in school, and there were some off-the-field issues, but the Chiefs took a chance on him, and it's paid off. He's been one of the best defensive rookies in in the league. And, For and, sure. You know, no disrespect to Mel Kuyper, who's been doing this a long time, but you have two guys on here who are out with season-ending injuries, and Marcus Peter just, just seems to get the job done, and he's probably looking at being one of the best young corners in the league. Mm-hmm. Um, Adrian Amos, that's a biased pick. For the Bears, I mean, he's been starting for us since day one. Yeah, he's. I mean, he kind of, he's kind of like how uh, Micah Hyde was for the Packers okay. his first year. Good, good fill. I mean, the Packers pretty much played nickel that right. entire year. He was their nickel back, um, and he was a good fill in. I think that's the same thing with uh, with Amos. Um, I wouldn't necessarily put him in the list of defensive rookie of the year, but he'll probably be the bear starter for for years to come. Yep. Uh, Stephon Anthony, um, for those of you who don't know who Anthony is, this weekend the Saints blocked an extra point. Yep. And he picked it up and returned it for for two points. Two points. Um, That was the first time in NFL history that 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 had happened. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, so he'll obviously have that on his – his record going forward. Yeah. But he also made, to me, um, you know, if Cam Newton doesn't go down the field on an MVP-type drive, Stephon Anthony made the play of the game where he stripped Jonathan Stewart, was laying on top of the pile, and had the awareness to get up and run into the end zone, um, despite what was going on around the f- you know on the field with players arguing that the whistle was blown. But just to have that awareness, um, among his other stats, he's another guy who's possibly rookie defense player of the year. A lot of people, I think he was the 31st overall pick yep. of the draft, and a lot of people turned their heads saying, what? Who's yeah. this guy? And I think what really helped Anthony was um, he, uh, kind of stay in the shadows was Vic Beasley, uh, his Clemson yes. teammate. Yep. Everybody talking about Vic Beasley. He was the 8th overall pick to Atlanta, but um, I wanted the Packers to draft Stephon Anthony because yeah. now he is showing that he's – an incredible middle linebacker, um, and had a great game on the same day Jonathan Vilma retired. Yeah. Another yeah. great yeah. middle linebacker. Another, gr- another great middle linebacker. And the last one I got that I thought um, could easily be on this list is Thomas Rawls. I mean, For I, don't sure. th- I, don't oh, think anybody, I don't think anybody expected absolutely. him to be able to come in and replace Marshawn Lynch, let alone anybody come in and replace Marshawn Lynch. Um, but as an undirected free agent, he came in and, and – uh, the, the stats are not updated, but going into yesterday's game, you're talking about almost 700 yards rushing, uh, three touchdowns, and one receiving touchdown. I, he's probably the best undrafted free agent in this in this class right now. Um, but just this just goes to show where, you know, that he should be he or could be among among the best running backs um, in the league going forward. Um, yeah, and I think I, I we talked about this before, but the, I think Raw spells the end for Marshawn Lynch. I think the reason why um, they, uh, you know, Pete Carroll and Seattle have been hanging on to Marshawn Lynch. Well, first of all, he's been a great running back, but second of all, they hadn't had much faith in who was coming after. I don't, you know, they liked Turbin and Christian Michael, but they never said. Okay, you guys. One of you guys are the starter now. With Rawls, now they can push Lynch out the door and have a, a much cheaper Thomas Rawls starting. Yeah, and and go to go to say what you were talking about with uh, how Seattle had Turbin and Michael and didn't like uh, what they saw. Jerry Jones must like something because he picked up both of them. <laughs> <laughs> so well, yeah. Dallas, Dallas must, must really like something in both of them uh, to kind of grab those two and go for it. Uh, and just – well, did you watch that game last night? No, I didn't. The Redskins-Cowboys game? I, I didn't watch it either. I, I turned it on. I had, You know, I was watching the Bucks game who won uh, very close, almost buzzer beater last oh. night. Uh, it was a very fantastic game. But <clears throat> just – I watched that game for about five minutes, and I was just like, this is the worst football game that I've ever watched <laughs> on television, and shut it off. And then all of a sudden, from my understanding, in like the last minute and a half, like 20-some points were miraculously scored, and I, I saw a clip. Deshaun Jackson is, is returning a punt. He runs backwards 25 yards. And fumbles the ball oh on gosh. the 10-yard line. And then somehow I, they ended up with the ball back. 
and Deshaun Jackson scores like a, a 40 or 50 yard touchdown. Like the next play, I, I guess. I mean, similar situation to, to Ted Ginn. I guess you just got to live with what you got. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I mean, Deshaun Jackson. He really is a rich man's Ted Ginn. Pretty that, much. That, hey, that is true. Um, so hashtag rich man's Ted Ginn. Ted hey, Ginn. yeah. There hashtag rich man. Hashtag that. All right. So for our three followers on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Let's uh let's take a little bit of a break here. We'll come right. back. We'll get into some some college football stuff and uh, let you guys know. Playoff teams. Okay, Richie, give me your best evil laugh. <clears throat> <laughs> All right, here's my. <laughs> what do you think? Is that good? Uh, we'll work on it. We'll work on it. So, uh, despite what Jim Morris says, we are going to talk about playoffs. Playoffs? No, nope, we're talking about it. Playoffs? Yep, we're, we're going to talk about playoffs. All right, so this week, uh, Sunday, they announced the the four that are in. The four? Um, and They're and, doing four now. Yeah, they're, they're doing four. Okay. And um, Michigan State was able to, to jump Oklahoma. Obviously, for those of you that don't know, Michigan State was able to beat, beat Iowa. Beat Iowa. And, and I watched that it game, was a, and that was, that was a slugfest. They played, yeah, they oh, they deserved that win. Oh, yeah. They deserved oh, yeah. that there, win. I don't think there was a, a well-deserved, or a more deserved win than that one. Yes. I mean, Alabama kind of blew out Florida. Uh-huh. And we'll get into the Clemson situation in a little bit. But that Michigan State-Iowa game, that was just... It was. It was like knock them, sock them, robots. I mean, it just, it just it was kept like, coming. It was good. If anybody is a winner coming out of that, it's the Big Ten. Right, absolutely. Um, so... Let's get into it. Clemson, number one. Alabama, number two. Michigan State, number three. Um, obviously, because Oklahoma didn't play this last weekend, but did yes. enough to keep themselves in at, at number four. Uh, so we have Clemson, Oklahoma, Alabama, Michigan State. What are your predictions? I mean, are we looking at a case where we could have a blowout game? Uh, are both games going to be close? I mean, what are you um, thinking? Here? I think this is going to be a really good game. Okay. I think it's a good matchup. I think Michigan State kind of... Uh, proved that they're that they're still a really good team, and um, yeah, I think I, I think they're uh, D'Antonio. Is it is yeah, D'Antonio? Uh, yeah. I, I yeah, I was thinking D'Antoni. Yeah, gotcha. um, but D'Antonio, I think he'll have his team ready for this match, and um, it's one that I definitely will not miss. Yeah, uh, me neither. Um, I mean, last year we saw. Uh, Ohio State kind of blow out Alabama and Oregon uh, blow out Florida State. Yeah. Um, I agree. I think this year both games are going to be closer. I, I uh, do agree. I think Clemson, Oklahoma, I mean, you better put your over under at 120 because that game is going to, there's just going to be score after score after score mm-hmm. uh, in that one. And Alabama, Michigan State, I, I think we're going to see similar to what we saw this past week with Michigan State. Iowa. Iowa. I, I think it's just going to be a slugfest because we're going to get a whole lot of Derrick Henry and we're going to get a whole lot of Michigan State defense mm-hmm. and something's got to give. Um, I do think, though, that Alabama is the better team. So I do think that we will see a number one, number two national champion in, in Clemson, Alabama, despite I love Oklahoma and would love to see this be Oklahoma's year. I just think right now... Uh, Deshaun Watson and that the whole Alabama team are just far and above better than everybody else right now. I think whoever comes out of the Alabama Michigan State wins. Okay. Um, whoever wins that game, I think will win the whole thing. Okay. Okay. I I can see some. I can see uh, a lot of backlash from that game though, in, in a negative way that they just beat the mess out of each other, uh, where injuries could happen or guys just That's are true. so worn from that game. That you know something something bad could happen uh, to one of those teams going down. Um, so who's so your eventual champion is either Alabama or Michigan State, the yeah. winner of that game. Okay. Um, so also the Heisman candidates were announced. Yep. Uh, Deshaun Watson, quarterback, Clemson, uh, only a sophomore. Mm-hmm. Christian McCaffrey, he broke Barry Sanders all, all purpose. purpose. Now. <clears throat> I don't want to take anything away from from Christian McCaffrey um, because those numbers that he has are incredible. You're talking about almost 3,500 all-purpose yards from a single player in a single season. Yeah. But Barry Sanders did it in three less games. 
three less games. That I mean, that to me is is incredible and speaks to the talent of Barry Sanders. But Christian McCaffrey did McCaffrey or did Sanders ever score a passing, rushing, and receiving? I, that I game? I don't think so. That's pretty good. But but Christian McCaffrey is a real deal. Like I said, I don't he want is. to take anything. Yes, I don't want to take anything away from him, and not to to necessarily play the race card. But Christian McCaffrey is probably the best white running back that we have seen in a long time. Now Toby Gerhardt was great in college, hasn't done much in the pros, but I think Christian McCaffrey projects into the NFL okay. as a as a good running back. Uh, to me. He's do you, a, you, he's do you a think short, he converts to receiver though? I don't. To me, the the best comparison that I have is I think, uh, and this is this is a bold statement. I think he's Matt Forte. Really? I do. I wow. think Christian McCaffrey is Matt Forte. Just the way that he's able to catch the ball. If they need to line him up in the slot, they can. But at the same time, he can run between the tackles because he's not a small person. He is a bigger guy. Uh, but he can run in between the tackles as we see, like he does at Stanford. But I, I just think his athletic ability, he watching him play, he's a little bit faster than Forte because Forte is big and long where his strides are a little bit longer. Okay. He just kind of um, grazes across the grass, I guess, so to speak, where you know he just runs away from people. McCaffrey is just fast and, and, and quick. But he t- I, I'm very impressed with, okay. with McCaffrey and Derrick Henry. Who I think right now we we talked about as being probably it's it's his Heisman to lose. Yes, right I but I mean he has good competition. I I wouldn't I have nothing to like argue with these three. Mm-hmm. I think all three of them deserve to get a nomination. Um, but yeah, I think he's gonna win. Okay. If if I had to if I had to guess, is this gonna be the closest Heisman race in a long time? I mean, we kind of knew, um, like, Johnny Menzel, when Menzel won it, we kind of knew I mean, Menzel was going to get it, and Jameis the same way. Well, I mean, what saw. was the last close, was it with RG3, um, RG3, Luck, and Sue? It might have been. I, I honestly Was really, Sue in really, that really, one? really don't know. Was, was Sue was not in the Or no, it, uh, Monte Ball was in that one, right? Um, I know RG3 so and Luck right, were competing. Right. Um, but I, I think... But I, I think, and, and maybe not close in terms of votes because I don't have the voting numbers, yeah. but in terms of the idea that um, I think we kind of knew gonna Menzel was going to win. We kind of knew, knew Jameis was, was going to win and Mary. You know, we kind of had a feeling of yeah. who was going to get it. Um, yeah, I think this one is going to be really close. I, I do too, and, and I agree. I, with, I, ho- I hope McCaffrey wins, though. I, I hope I He's hope growing wins. on me. Yeah. I, I don't know what it is, but he's just... He, I'm not a big Stanford fan. I don't like Stanford, but he, just watching him play, it grows on me. Just his talent and his ability. I, yeah. th- I think he's going to be a a fantastic player um, going into into the NFL. Um, <clears throat> some other big news happened this week. Obviously, we know that coaching changes are going to happen. There's a lot. Um, so South Carolina gave theirs to Muschamp, um, who was formerly at Florida. Had some struggles. But to me, the, the bigger story on this is, and I want, I want to get your take, he is offering his running back coaching job to Marcus Lattimore, okay. former South Carolina yep. running back, who I think everybody, uh, when he first came on the scene, said, this is the next guy. I mean, this is a special, yep. special kid at the running back position. I think he was a lock for the first round. People were saying next Adrian Peterson. You know, those, those big hype comparisons. Uh-huh. And he just freak freak injuries freak with injury. the ACLs. And now he could possibly go back to his alma mater and be, be a running back coach. I mean, does that speak uh, more to, to kind of where Lattimore was to where he could be now as a coach? Or do we give the credit to Muschamp for being a classy guy and saying, I hey. Think, I think Muschamp, I think this is a move for Muschamp. He wants you know, South Carolina fans to trust him more. Yeah. You know, with Florida, it didn't go so well. Right. And he's he's connecting himself to the community by bringing in Lattimore. And I don't have too much of a problem with that as long as Lattimore knows what he's doing. Right. Yeah. If As long as he Lattimore gets the job done as a coach and the running backs perform, I agree. Yeah. No, no questions asked. Uh, so Dino Barbres, uh leaves Bowling Green for Syracuse. Uh, four years ago... Bob Rays was an FCS coach and now is a FBS coach. In two years at Bowling Green, he has a record of 18 and 9, 37 and 16 overall. He won the East in the MAC twice, and he won the MAC title once. Mm-hmm. 
So we see these schools where coaches kind of blossom, you know, one or two years, and then boom, they're gone. Uh, we saw with Arkansas State how they had uh, Hugh, Hugh Freeze, who went to Ole Miss, and then Gus Malzahn, Brian Harson now at Boise State. Um, is Bowling Green kind of that school where it's like this is the, the mid-major? If you want to be a, a top-notch coach, go hang out at Bowling Green for a little bit. Well, I don't think it's Bowling Green specifically. I think it's the MAC Conference because yeah. I think there, if you're smarter with – I mean, obviously the MAC isn't going to get top recruits, but if you're smart with recruiting, if you right. can get the right guys um, to play for you, um, obviously you do have a good future and will eventually go up to a school where you do get good recruiting. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. Uh, the biggest surprise to me was Bronco Mendenhall leaving BYU for Virginia. Okay. To me, Virginia has a ceiling. Um, they're only going to win so many games, just not necessarily because of who they are, uh, their basketball school. And, and yes. we see with certain schools. I mean, and a baseball school, right? And a baseball school. And we've seen some schools, you know, like like a Texas, who at one point was great at all three. Uh, but there's not many of those schools to go around. No. I mean, there's, you know, maybe North Carolina right now, um, who's usually one of the best baseball schools I mean, in the country. They're mm, hot for football and basketball. At Florida State, right? But but. You know, just us having a hard time coming up with school yeah. shows how, how hard it is. And to me, Virginia kind of has a glass lead on how good they can be as as a program. Whereas BYU uh, was an independent school, could kind of pick their own schedule. 99-42 overall as a head coach. He won the Mountain West twice before they went independent. Okay. Um, and then he was the coach of the year. Um, but the reason this, this kind of sticks out to me was I think there's a bigger picture here. I don't want to speculate. Um, but... Mendenhall applied for the Wisconsin job. Yes. So when Wisconsin, obviously Wisconsin, it's a state job. They can release um, all the applications if, if asked. They have to release that information because it's a it's a public job. Mm -hmm. And Mendenhall's name was one of the shockers on that list. Now we know BYU has certain restrictions in terms of of their religion. Um, will BYU ever get back to what we saw with Steve Young? I mean, a national title contender. Or is it just there's too many restrictions for them in terms of today's athletes that they won't be able to, to recruit those five stars that they need to Yeah, I to think win. those restrictions are scaring recruits away. And on top of that, now that they're independent, um, I think that hurts them. Okay. Because, I mean, are they would they be ever considered to, for like a playoff? Right. You know, even even if they had a good season, S similar to Notre Dame this Correct. year, how Notre Dame was an independent, they yeah. were mentioned for the playoffs, but then ultimately kind of fell off here at the end, and yeah. it, it seemed to hurt them being an independent. So yeah, I think that's going to hurt BYU big time. Um, Rutgers hires Chris Ash, much like I yep. talked about with Maryland uh, hiring Durkin, somebody who's familiar with the Big Ten. These are teams that are new to the Big Ten, but obviously want to try to to get their footprint in the conference um, and succeed as uh, Chris Ash was at Wisconsin and recently Ohio State, um, and before that, Arkansas. So he's a Bielema guy, um, and this is his first head coaching job. Um, like I said, four years in the Big Ten as a D coordinator, 41 years old. I mean, we've seen, we've seen coaches uh, do it before, um, but – let me ask you this. In terms of, let's say you're an athletic director, mm -hmm. do you feel um, in, in today's day, hey, let's go hire the next young guy? Or are you a guy who says, you know what, I want somebody who's been there, done that, that can help me establish? Um, or do you see flaws with both, positives with both? Uh, there, I mean, there's positive and negatives with both. I mean, if you hire the young guy, sure, I mean, it looks, looks good, but at the same time, they don't have experience. Vice versa for the old coach. Um, so honestly, I would just go best candidate. I, I'm not too... Well, if I had to choose, I would go the younger coach. Okay. Just because I think if you bring in an older coach um, that's maybe from... That's that's coached in a different era, mm -hmm. uh, they might have uh, old-fashioned ideas that just doesn't fit with uh, today's game. I agree. I, I would I go would, younger. I would go with the younger one as well. <clears throat> so now... Here, here's an interesting situation. East Carolina, uh, they were in CUSA as early, or within the last five years, they moved from uh, CUSA to the American Conference. Yes. Um, Ruffin McNeil played at East Carolina uh, from 1976 to 1980. He was a defensive back, and they fired him. 
and this is the first year that uh, East Carolina has been under 500 in conference play under McNeil. So I went to, to Google Ruffin McNeil um, just to kind of get some information on him. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that, that popped up was somebody from SB Nation, which is kind of like a blog site for every school has one. Uh, the, the topic was, what the hell are you thinking? Um, 43 and 34 overall record while he was there. And I'm sorry, one losing record. One in, losing record. One losing season in conference. In conference. In his entire time at, at East Carolina. Um, this, to me, brings back memories of Lovey Smith when Chicago fired him after 10-6. and six. But how can you justify firing a coach who's had a lot of success? Well, I think a lot of it has to do is switching conferences. Um, I mean, obviously, moving up to the Atlantic Conference, that's kind of an upgrade. And I think what they're thinking is they want to upgrade coaches. Um, now, Ruffin McNeil, he's had a good career at East Carolina, but they obviously think they can get somebody better, um, which will be interesting to see. Now, um, as somebody who, who in the next year will become an alum, um, in terms of graduating, because you'll yeah. be graduating here, yeah. um, is it, how, would that, how does that play out to you? I mean, he, he plays at the school. He does well at the school as a coach. I mean, do you think that if you were an athletic director – to hire an alum, does that make things a little bit trickier? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and you can kind of go back uh, the Green Bay Packers when they hired Bart Starr as head coach. Okay. Um, he had a long career. I mean, I, he coached for six, seven, eight years, a long time. I think he only had one winning record, and that was, that was uh, when the season was cut in half due to a strike. Okay. And... Um, you know, if they had maybe let go of him earlier, they probably would have gotten back on track quicker than the early 90s. But since Bart Starr is, you know, pretty he's much the that, Packers. He's Bart Starr. He's right. the Packers' golden child, you know. And the same thing with Forrest Gregg. They had Forrest Gregg as a head coach. He didn't do too well. So, yeah, that, it's it's kind of mixing business and pleasure. Um, so I would – it obviously that does make it a lot more difficult. Um Larry Fedora is the head coach at North Carolina. Uh, they gave him a seven-year extension um, after this year. Obviously, we talked about it last week that North Carolina was at number 10. If they beat Clemson, do they get into the playoff? Just how well they, yeah. they played this year. Um, he's 32-18 and 18 at North Carolina as a head coach. Uh, this is their first nine-win season since Mac Brown. Texas's Mac Brown left in 1997. Uh, but did you did you watch that game against Clemson at all? I didn't. I didn't watch it. No. So, uh, at the end of the game, uh, North Carolina scores a touchdown, and they're down seven points, and they go to kick an onside kick. And the rule is you cannot pass, obviously, the line of scrimmage. Otherwise, that's off offsides mm -hmm. on the kicking team, right? So, they kick the ball. Nobody's within two yards of the line of scrimmage. North Carolina recovers. Uh, I'm thinking, oh my God, we got a game here. This is this is great. This is awesome. This is great for college football. Two great teams just going at it, and the ref throws a flag, mm. and set and calls offsides. Mm. Rules are not. Uh, you can't you can't go back and review penalties. Yes. Um, so obviously they they replayed it on TV over and over and over, looking for something to say. The refs were right, and they could not. They could not yeah. find it. They made North Carolina re-kick it. Clemson got the ball game over essentially. Um, now, we saw the situation with the fail Mary, and and some situations where other refs have been uh, criticized, like we said with the Wisconsin game. To you, does this call? Um, what, is this a suspension to you? I mean. How to many, the refs? For the refs, yeah. I mean, how many times is it, you know, yes. we, we see all these these penalties, and, and apparently uh, leagues are doing all these things to, to keep their officials up to date on the rules yeah. and trying to help them develop their skills and whatnot. But when is too much, too much in yeah. terms of mistakes for referees at any level for any sport? Yeah, I didn't see the play, but the way you described it, it sounded like it was pretty clear it wasn't oh, it was, on yeah, offside. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, refs can't make that mistake, and... Um, 
you know, no matter what it takes, whether it's a suspension or, or putting refs down to uh, less important games, something needs to be done to try and make sure that this doesn't happen again. One of the, one of the things that, that gets talked about is the ability to go back and review penalties. I wouldn't do that just because I think I think the game uh, already we're seeing a lot a lot more time where nothing's happening and and the refs are in the booth discussing stuff. We want less of that, you know, or else this is gonna this is gonna become baseball. Yeah, where right. We just sit around, and, and that kind of leads to my next question of if if we do if they do agree to start reviewing calls. People aren't going to want to become officials anymore because it kind of seems like you're taking everything yeah. out of their hand. If they're just going to be scrutinized, who, who wants to do a job where you're constantly being looked over and, and somebody's just leaning over your shoulder the entire time you know, you're doing something? And essentially, we wouldn't need referees because yeah. then you know coaches or whoever can just walk over to, to the booth and say, oh, okay, this is what happened. All right. Exactly. You, can, you know? And, and I, exactly. I mean, and probably the next – if we do – if we do begin to challenge penalties, then what? I mean, what happens? You know, if somebody throws a fat flag and says, "Oh, number seventy-six held my defensive end," you yeah. know, I mean, w you could go on forever, right? Because uh, maybe a non-call, yeah, um, much like we saw with the. Uh, I mean, um, was it Janice? Uh, the, there was apparently yeah. the pass interference situation yeah. where there was a no call, um, where some people thought it was pass interference. I thought it was a good call. Um, it, I mean, it was it was questionable. Right. It was debatable. But, but, I think you could have yeah. gone either way. Um, but I mean, and then we're gonna see teams hiring, you know, several coaches just to watch for penalties. Yeah. That's too. It's too much. Hey, that helps me because that that opens my market a little bit as a coach. I would sure, <laughs> sure, but <laughs> but uh, right, right. Well, that's not the way that we want the game. No, no, game it, to go that's destroying the means. game. Um, but. After the game, um, I did not watch the the post conferences, um, but one thing stuck out to me about Fedora. Um, after the game was over, they did have they you know how they have the camera there for mm -hmm. the handshake of the two coaches. Um, so Fedora and Sweeney are walking the midfield, and Fedora you know shakes his hand, doesn't say anything about about the bone call, grabs him and says, "Hey, you know, great game, coach. No matter what, we are rooting for you." go win a national championship. To me, I mean, that's as classy as it gets. Yeah. Um, I didn't know much about Larry uh, Fedor before. Um, you know, as a person, I knew him as a coach. Obviously, obviously he was at Southern Miss, North Carolina. I know that stuff. But but to me, that speaks about him as a human being and as an individual. And then after talking with Sweeney, goes up to Deshaun Watson, tells him how great of a player he is and that he should go win himself a Heisman Trophy and a national championship. And for, for one coach to say that to the opposing team, after possibly being screwed out of this game, to say that to the opposing coach and the opposing star, um, to me just speaks about uh, how good of a man he is. And if it was me, I my kids can play for him any day. Um, that's just definitely uh, Willie Taggart, five-year extension, South Florida. Did interview with South Carolina. So, when Charlie, we were talking about like a coach being fired for success or firing a coach early in a process. You're talking about losing. Yeah. Um, Taggart in his first two years was six and eighteen at South Florida. Um, they go eight and four this year, and this is their first bowl game since 2010, which I think uh, was Jason Pierre Paul's year. And they'll be facing number 25 uh, Western Kentucky in in that bowl game. Um, and then the last bit of news, Sonny Cumbie leaving TCU possibly for Texas. I mean, TCU to Texas, I mean, that's kind of a, a downgrade for me. I mean, wouldn't you say? I think, I think, I mean, people always say Texas is on the, they're on the, the up and up. Um, and, I mean, considering that it is Texas, you know, the Texas Longhorns, no matter, you know, I mean, they haven't been successful since, was since Colt McCoy left. Right. So, I don't know. Um, I think with Texas, there's always more potential than TCU. So, we'll see. All right. Uh, we'll take a small break. And I want to come back and get your opinion on how much money per year is too much for one player. All right. Hey, Ben, have you ever been to a baseball game? Oh, you betcha. Oh, 
nine dollars a beer, seven dollars a hot dog. Don't you seem like that's just too expensive? It's just too much. So instead of spending your money on something like that, you can go ahead and make us more popular for free. Hey. Okay, it's a little bit of change of plans here. Uh, we're we're not going to talk about baseball until tomorrow. Yeah, my my apologies. If you're okay with that, my apologies, um, uh, sports fans. Baseball can wait. Baseball can wait. The winter meetings will still be going on. Absolutely. As will our weekly debates. Oh. So uh, last week we talked about uh, who the greatest Carolina Panther of all time is. You said Julius Peppers. I said Steve Smith. Yep. We got votes in from both Facebook and Twitter. Which we want to thank uh, those fans that Absolutely. that did uh, take the time to yep. to post. Um, our winner, unfortunately, our winner by one vote. One vote did not go. E, the way that that I was hoping. Yes, uh, Steve Smith. You you won. guys determined. I won Steve the debate. Smith. Yes, Ben. So I am up one nothing. Ben won the debate. Thanks to you guys. All right, and now we have another debate, which we talked about a little bit Friday. I'll set up the situation here. Yep. So we're talking basketball. Yep. Your team is down by two. Mm-hmm. Three seconds left. Mm -hmm. Who do you give the ball to? I think you could have. We could have gone a lot of different ways, and it's obviously Absolutely. current NBA players. So yep. no LeBron, no Larry Bird, no Kareem. LeBron's in there. Oh, LeBron's I'm sorry. I meant MJ. I meant yep. MJ. Yep. Yep. Um, I'm already getting mixed up. It's pretty exciting. Uh, so, yeah. um, so you started last time. I'll start this time. Okay. So if I'm looking at current NBA players. I, and based on this argument, I'm basing it off of a couple different things. Okay. One, good shooters, mm -hmm. obviously. Right. Um, two, the situation. Mm -hmm. So you're down by two. You can go for two to tie, three to win. Right. So you could basically go for uh, any of them. And three, um, basically variety of shooting. So not just a three-pointer, not just a, a layup or anything, no matter – you know, who can shoot it in the most different ways. And when I'm looking at that, the first name that comes to me is Kevin Durant. Okay. Kevin Durant is, I mean, he's, he's he was hurt all last year, but it seems like he's at 100% right now. But um, what, what it is for me is you've seen so many uh, buzzer beaters and game winners already for him. So he knows what he's doing. He can play in the clutch. Um, second of all, he can shoot it in so many different ways. I would say besides Dirk Nowitzki, he's the best at the fadeaway. Um, he can shoot uh, top of the key. He can shoot uh, the three-point in the corner. Um, I, I mean, and, and as for, you know, free throws and that the, the wing, he can shoot all of them. Second, or third of all, He's six foot ten. All right, that shot is not getting blocked, no matter who you put on him. I mean, whether it's, I mean, I mean, maybe maybe Porzingis, but he can block anybody's shot. So I, that's why I'm going with Kevin Durant. So last week when when we talked about the, the Panthers, um, I threw a bunch of numbers at you in terms of what Julius Peppers has has done or had sure. done for for the Carolina Panthers. Numbers. We're not going to do it for me this week. Um, to me, it was no question um, Steph Curry. Okay. Um, to me, like you mentioned, uh, you get three seconds, so it's not a catch and shoot situation. No. Um, so you get the opportunity, it, but you know, for a dribble a or to get, to get to the to the hole. And I don't know if there's a hotter guy on the planet right now than than Steph Curry. Um, he knocks it down at will. If he even gets a sliver of an opening. It's going in, um, whether it's a three point, whether it's a mid range, and I've seen him attack attack the rim um, with the best of them in terms of NBA guards. And no matter you know whether Kevin Durant's seven, eight, nine inches taller than Steph Curry, um, to me Steph Curry is more dangerous due to the fact that you know Kevin Durant. Uh, yes, he's tall and he'll go up over the top of you, but you can't guard Steph Curry. I mean, if Steph Curry catches the ball, one or two dribbles, you're probably calling an ambulance to come get you because your ankles are gone. Um, and Steph Curry finds a way to, to get his own shot up. And more times than not, he, it's going to go in. Okay. Let me ask you a question. You probably don't know this on the top of your head, but give me a broad statement. How many game winners has Steph Curry made? Um... 
You don't even have to tell me because I know the answer is not as much as Kevin Durant's. Okay. All right. Okay. And experience aside, Kevin Durant has shown that, I mean, he's he has a video game body. All right? Yeah. Everybody wants the, the tall, skinny guy. I mean, sure, you can talk about, oh, he needs to lift some weights, but that doesn't matter in this situation. Yeah, I got He you. is a shooter, and it seems like he is built for this last-second shot. I mean, give him the ball anywhere. Um, whether it's behind the three-point line, um, in the paint, outside of the paint, anywhere, I mean, he'll he'll put it up. Yeah, um, I I'm not disagreeing with you. Um, I do vaguely remember watching an OKC game where Kevin Durant did hit a game winner. So he has done it before. He's done it a lot um, to my Mavericks, but unfortunately, in the playoffs. For for me, Kevin Durant is a great shooter. Yes, he he does have. Uh, unbelievable measurables, but um, when when you're the best shooter on the face of the planet, um, it, it's kind of hard to to go against you. Um, and and we've seen time after time after time, Steph Curry hit incredible shots. We've seen Steph Curry hit uh, three pointers with hands in his face, with people you know running at him wide open, whatever it is. Steph Curry finds a way to make the ball go in yeah. the rim, you know, into the hoop. And, and that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about who's going to put the ball in the hoop with three seconds left on the clock. And to me, I, I don't think that anybody – I can trust anybody to have the accuracy um, at any given moment, any given shot than Steph Curry. You were right when you said that Steph Curry is the best shooter in the NBA. I agree with that. However, Peja Stojakovic was once the best shooter in the NBA in one season. He had a big season. I mean, like kind of like Steph Curry. He, he made everything that he shot. However, I, um, I wouldn't give him the ball at the last second. I wouldn't. I don't think he's a guy that the team could lean on. And... Even when we're talking about best shooters in the league right now, the difference between Steph Curry and Kevin Durant is not that much. Yeah, I think what people are forgetting about Kevin Durant right now is because they have huge, I mean, incredibly athletic Russell, Russell Westbrook. Westbrook yeah. People are forgetting about how great of a shooter Durant really is. Mm -hmm. And, I, I mean, I guarantee if, if you still give him this chance, three seconds left, down by two, Chances are he's gonna make it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not doubting uh, Kevin Durant's ability or, or um, you know, position to, to make that shot. Kevin Durant was actually one of the names that I had thought of uh, when you had proposed this to me. A couple of different names had run run through my head. Um, I thought about the possibilities of Kobe Bryant, but I mean, now no, I, I would not, not take really, Kobe no. ten years ago. You know, maybe even fifteen years ago. I don't think. There's any question that that we take Kobe yeah. or or a Reggie Miller? I agree um, with who's, you there. Who's obviously inactive? Um, then uh, bringing up the current uh, hurt me a little bit because I go back to a former Buck in Ray Allen was was a name that crossed my mind and Kevin Durant, like I said, crossed my mind. But as names kept scrolling through my head and I'm thinking of all these these great shooters and like I said, it's not a catch and shoot situation. So you you have a chance to get to the rim. And, and for me, that was actually one of the only reasons that I thought about about Giannis because he can essentially get to the rim at will, um, kind of like LeBron, and which who else across my mind. But I think in three seconds, anything that you can do, whether it's a dribble pull-up, get around a screen and, and hit a jumper, or get to the rack, I, I don't know if there's a more complete mm -hmm. player with such limited time on the clock than, than Steph Curry. Okay, here are my final thoughts, and then you can have your final thoughts. Um, unless that was your final thoughts. No. Um, yeah, yeah, you, I think I'll let you okay. finish it off. Yeah. Okay, so Steph Curry, yeah, like you said, he's a great player. But I think in that situation, down by two, three seconds left, he's shooting a three. All right. I don't think he... I don't think he has what it takes to go up for a layup. I think people are going to, whatever defense is playing him is going to close on him and block that shot. I, there's no blocking Kevin Durant. 
All right, with Kevin Durant, there is a lot more unpredictability. He may shoot a three. He may uh, drive in for a layup. He may even just draw a foul. But there is no way that that shot is getting blocked. With Steph Curry, if he shoots a three, yeah, I mean, he can take a drop, couple dribbles, maybe get open, uh, you know, and somehow shoot it. Um, and th then you even said uh, complete shooter. I don't think Steph Curry is the most complete shooter in the NBA. He's the best three-point shooter, but I think the most complete shooter in the NBA is Kevin Durant because he can hit it all over the field. Or, I, I'm sorry, the court. Uh, I'm thinking football here. But, yeah, that is my final thought. I think with Kevin Durant, there is way more unpredictability, whereas Steph Curry, I think... I think chances are there's an 80% chance he's shooting a three-pointer. If he doesn't, I think he misses. All right. Well, we're talking sports fans. You heard it here first. Kevin Durant versus Stephen uh, Curry. Steph Curry. The both are. Game. I mean, I would. Yeah, I mean, I, I like them both. I, I'm a big Kevin Durant guy. I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't be I, mad with choosing either of them. Yeah. And and I, I mean, I like Kevin Durant. I was always a, a big fan of Kevin Durant. I like his game. Um, for for majority of the reasons that you said with his length and just his ability as a player, um, I'd like to see him get a ring someday. I, I think he's one of those guys who who deserves it. I think um, I he, think he'll end up getting a ring eventually if this OKC team doesn't pan out. I think he'll end up going. He'll kind of a big three situation like Miami, maybe team up with another super. He's with another superstar right now. Yeah, with so with, I mean, with, and with and Ibaka's not that bad himself. Yeah, um, they got a big three situation. But uh, we're talking sports fans. Make sure you get on Facebook, Twitter. Yeah. Uh, let us know what you're feeling, who you would take. I mean, maybe you don't take KD or Steph Curry. Maybe you like somebody else. Maybe you like a Kyle Korver or, or a Dirk Nowinski. You know, Dirk, yeah. Dirk has had some, some big shots over his yep, career. He's had several buzzer beaters you himself. Know? So uh, let us know who you're talking. And uh, just kind of uh, we're going to come at you tomorrow. Um, yep. Again, we back apologize for, for what happened yesterday. Um, so back-to-back -back episodes coming at you. And tomorrow we're going to get into a little bit of uh, Zach Granke, you know, some, some, some winter meeting stuff for baseball. Yeah, forget about David Price. Yeah. Zach yeah. Granke. Zach Granke. Um, and then we'll, we'll get into LeBron's. LeBron's Nike deal LeBron. and all the questions behind that. So we're talking sports fans. Thanks for listening, right. and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, guys.